So I want to start by thanking Jim and uh, uh, for having me here and for um, his team and kind of putting together such a wonderful um, workshop. I know the past few days I've gotten a lot of a lot out of the talks, um, so I hope um, you all have as well. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Sienna models, and I've packed a lot into these slides. Um, too much um, that I really shouldn't get to all of it, so and I don't think I have the time to. But what my hope is that um, what you all can do is walk away with a kind of conceptual understanding of what is it that a Sienna model can do, um, what kind of uses are there for a Sienna model, some of the kind of options and, and, and kinds of uh, considerations that um, kind of go into putting together a Sienna model. And then there's a lot of detail in there that if this is something of interest, you can go back and look at the slides and really understand a little bit more of kind of the, the machinery um, behind running such a model. Okay, so I want to start off first with, um, with an example and, and kind of a, a scenario where we might want to use this kind of a model. Okay, so imagine that um, we're studying um, something like smoking and there's a school that has an incredibly high prevalence of smoking and we want to understand um, why and we think that networks might be involved. Okay, here's an example of one such school. This is um, one of the schools from the Ad Health data. And we've got the um, nodes here um, colored by their smoking status. Okay? Darker nodes are more um, are heavier smokers, lighter nodes are non-smokers or lighter um, smokers. Okay? And looking at the graph, we don't see a whole lot um, you know, that, that smoking matters a whole lot, although we do kind of see there are some lighter nodes over here indicating you know, folks who aren't smoking maybe are, are congregating. A few are darker nodes over here. We can't tell much um, from looking at it, though. Uh, we run a few simple statistics. Um, so we can look at the correlation between in degree and smoking. Okay? And we get a positive correlation here. Right? That's telling us that the kids who have more incoming ties, or, which is an indicator of popularity, that those kids are more likely to be smokers. We can also calculate whether or not smokers are more likely to associate with one another, non-smokers with one another, um, this idea of homophily. And if we calculate an odds ratio, um, the odds of having some, a friend of your, your same smoking status relative to the odds of having a friend of a different smoking status, we see the odds ratio is 1.57. It's greater than 1, telling us that there is a greater tendency towards um, having friends who are similar in smoking status. Okay, so we see some kind of association between the friendship network and smoking. Okay, now the question is why? Okay, is, it, is it peer influence? Um, what, what other kinds of processes might be going on? And here we need to uh, dive a little deeper and <clears throat> start thinking about processes that might be involved. Okay, so let's start first with homophily. Okay, and I'm going to start actually on the, on the right side here. Okay, this is what we observe. Okay, we see that Smokers are friends with one another, non-smokers are friends with one another. And the question is why? All right? Is it peer influence? Is it that these, these friends were maybe a little bit different and then they were influenced such that you know, B influenced A to start smoking, D influenced C to start, stop smoking? Or is it friend selection? Right? Is it that these, these folks weren't friends, um, but they became friends based upon similarity in smoking status or similarity in some of the things associated with smoking status. Maybe they're hanging out together. Um, smokers outside at lunch, non-smokers inside, something like that. Okay? So we've got two different ways that this pattern that we're observing can come about. Okay? It could be that the network is affecting behavior, or it could be that behavior is affecting the network. Okay? We think about this a lot in terms of homophily, but it's really true for any kind of association between network and behavior. Okay, so let me give you another example here. All right, here we have a smoker at time t who's more popular. Okay? Smoker's more popular, more incoming ties than the non-smokers. Okay? It could be that <clears throat> popularity leads to smoking. Okay? The network is affecting the behavior. That B is more popular, gives B more <clears throat> kind, of, kind of freedom or more kind of <clears throat> Um, capacity to engage in these risky kinds of behaviors. It could also be that behavior affects the network. 
okay, that <clears throat> B wasn't necessarily more popular. B starts smoking and then that draws ties. Okay, that, changes, that changes the network. Okay, so we have these two possibilities and we really want to discern one from the other. There's important um, policy, other kinds of implications for that. All right, now usually, I think this kind of crowd, the, the interest is mainly in how is it that the network is affecting behavior. If we're interested in health, we want to know, understand health outcomes and how the network might be affecting that. <clears throat> so if we want to be able to infer that the network is causing the behavior, we want, really want to control for a few other kind of alternative explanations. And the talk at noon yesterday was great in going through a number of these, um, <clears throat> a number of these possibilities. Some of the more important ones that we want to focus on are pre-existing similarities, okay, so selection into the relationships because they're already similar on the behavior. It could also be similarity on attributes correlated with behavior, right? So with smoking, kind of where people are smoking, that geographic, um, geographic position. Um, but we could also think about things like soci socioeconomic status. Um, anything that affects both the behavior and, um, and the network is something we want to control for. We also want to control for network processes, okay? Things like reciprocity, transitivity, these things can, can amplify or create more homophily than we would get in their absence. So this little diagram, <laughs> we've got one person here who really likes homophily. And nobody else really cares who their friends are, but this person really you know, believes in, in, in associating with people who are similar. So we see here reciprocity, they choose person D, D kind of chooses them back. We have a network tie here between two people who are similar, but it's not directly driven by homophily. Okay? It's driven by this network process, reciprocity. Okay? Similar process over here, transitivity. You know, we've got these pattern of ties. A third tie develops you know, because these people are, are hanging out in a group. This third tie develops. It's a homophilous tie, but it's not any kind of interest in homophily or peer influence on the behavior. It's this network process that's driving it. Okay? And so we want to be able to control for these different kinds of processes that all lead to the same kind of outcome in the end. Okay. So moving to the Siena model, um, <clears throat> there are a number of different kinds of questions that, that these can answer. So one is a question about peer influence. We can also answer questions about diffusion, which is, is similar in some ways. Um, you know, individuals um, influencing one another's behavior. With diffusion, though, we're, we're more interested in kind of a one-time state change. Okay? It's, not, it's not my smoking level goes up and down depending upon who my friends are. It's I start smoking because I have friends. And that's, that's the process we want to model. And Sienna models can do, can do both of those. Okay? We also might be interested in questions about network structure and how that changes over time. Okay? And that's actually I've, more of a, a long-standing interest of mine. It's not so much the behavior that we're interested in, but, but that structure that can affect the behavior. In terms of health, some, some similar outcomes, um, um, network outcomes that, that we might be interested in are questions about exclusion, kind of who's socially excluded, um, maybe has less access to social support, and other kinds of, of beneficial resources. Can we model, we can model kind of processes that lead to some people being social excluded. We can also model um, processes of withdrawal. People, um, for instance, who are depressed tend to become less interested in kind of social act activity relationships, may withdraw. We can model that kind of process as well. And more generally, the question here is, you know, if we think that networks have this impact on us through peer influence or other kinds of um, processes, then we really need to understand how is it people come to have the networks they have. Okay, so we need to start to answer that a priori question. And that leads into kind of the third reason we might want to use a Siena model is that <clears throat> there's really, when we start talking about kind of friendship networks or other kinds of networks and health behaviors, we see that there's a lot of reciprocal associations. Health affects our network. People in poor health um, generally can't have the same kind of, um, invest the same amount of energy in their relationships as people in good health. Um, people tend to seek others who are similar to themselves in health, um, health kinds of behaviors, health kinds of outcomes. 
So we see the networks, or health effects networks. We also see effects in the other direction. So if we really want to capture this kind of reciprocal feedback system, then we need a model that's able to, to accommodate both, um, changes in both of these. Okay, so before I start talking about Sienna models, um, let me just kind of place them in context of some of the other models that we've either talked about this week or that you're more familiar with here. Okay, so first of all, most of you, I imagine, came in with an understanding of models that explain individual health outcomes, or individual, individual, individual health outcomes. So we've got regression models that really don't account for much of the interdependency between individuals. Okay? They treat, treat individuals as kind of these atomistic entities. We can control for interdependencies or networks between individuals at a dyad level. We could also control for kind of the network um, and this is some of the, some of the stuff that, that Jake was talking about the other day. Um, there he is right there. <clears throat> Where we start to look at kind of weighted average models of how multiple people are influencing one person's attitudes or behaviors. Okay, so all of these are treating the individual attribute as the outcome and considering more and more of the kind of network of others who may influence that. <clears throat> this week is focused mainly on Networks and some of the, you may recognize some of these now, the Erdős Renyi model is just a random model that takes really no interdependency between individuals. We're just randomly um, kind of placing ties on a network. <clears throat> Quat models start to bring in some relational characteristics to explain other relational, relational outcomes. Um, ergums that we talked about yesterday, as well as latent space model brings in more of the network. Um, and tries to understand what that, what that network itself looks like. You see Sienna models over here on the end. Okay? They differ from all of these in that they are explicitly focused on both individual outcomes and the network outcomes. Okay? We're modeling changes in both of these over time. Okay? <clears throat> so in some ways, they are like ergums. Okay? And you'll see that when we actually start looking at model output, it looks a lot like you would get from an ergum, um, because we are modeling ties and their change over time. It also looks like um, some of these not network autoregression kinds of models, because we are taking into account other um, beha behaviors of others and how that influences one's own behavior. Okay. All right, so the rest of the kind of um, lecture part of this morning is going to focus, first of all, on what a Sienna model looks like. And we have two explicit functions okay, that, that relates to the previous slide. We're actually estimating a network function, okay, which, which is in, in many ways a separate model from a behavior function. Okay? They're two models that are estimated jointly um, with effects between the two. Okay? So these are where we're going to spend the majority of the time is understanding what a network function looks like, understanding what a behavior function looks like, because this is a model of change, um, we also have a couple of rate functions in here that determine the, um, how often change occurs in, in, in the networking behavior. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I don't want you to be surprised when you see that, that pop up. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about model estimation. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on here, but there's some important um, points here that, that, that um, really help understanding kind of what the model's doing and, and interpreting. Kind of, kind of grasping conceptually what it is that the model is doing and how. And then I'll provide an example and some, some of the exciting other things that we can do with these models. Uh, all right, and that, as I said, I've got a lot of information packed in here. If I skip over something or something um, is confusing, please don't hesitate to ask. <clears throat> all right, so the general model. Um, now, technically, I think we're calling these stochastic actor-oriented models um, or a stochastic actor-based model. I call it a Sienna model, and that's based upon the original name for this thing that um, is this kind of somewhat kludgy simulation investigation for empirical network analysis. Um, the first time this model was presented was in the town of Siena in Italy. So um, I think there was some, a clever way to make that the name of the model, um, and it's since, since stuck. Okay, it's only estim estimated in R at, at the moment. Um, 
And the main thing about the model is that it does. It recognizes that behaviors and individual, um, or behaviors and networks are interdependent. And it's an attempt to kind of model both of these simultaneously. <clears throat> okay, so to do this, the model actually takes as input panel data. Okay, so we have panel data on networks and simultaneous observations of individual behavior. Okay, so what, what we might have here is time one, we've got the network, and we've got the behavior, and then we may have time two, time three, and similar observations of the network and behavior. Okay, so we, we really only need two observations. Um, but we can bring in three or more um, <clears throat> if we have them. And what the model is doing is it's taking these discrete observations and it's going to <clears throat> use a MCMC algorithm to actually model step-by-step -step changes in the network over time. Okay, step-by-step -step changes in behavior over time. So it's going to take this network that's observed and allow one change, a change in one tie in the network at a time. One person to change their behavior by one unit at a time. And it's going to have many, 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 um, oftentimes thousands of opportunities um, for these changes to occur between each observation. Okay, so it's going to do that here as well. <clears throat> Okay, so we're taking, again, these panels, but the model is actually an agent-based model that simulates how this network and behavior could have co-evolved one step at a time. Okay, so from the perspective of the model, this is an actor, it's, it's, it's actor-oriented. It's identifying an actor and allowing them to change their network or change their behavior based upon, in the case of behavior, they may change their behavior based upon their friend's behavior or who they're currently connected to in the network at that point. In, the terms, of, in terms of the network, they'll change their network based upon uh, the network as it currently is. Okay, if someone's sending me a tie, maybe I'll send them a tie. Okay, if I have a friend has a friend over here, maybe I'll choose my friend's friend as a friend, this process of transitivity. Okay, so actors step by step will go through and <clears throat> make those kinds of changes. Okay, so we call each of these little steps a micro step. Um, and we make the assumption that actors are in full control of their ties and their behavior. Okay, so <clears throat> those changes occur based specifically on their outlook on the network and their own behavior and others' behavior, their friends' behavior that they see. That's it. Okay, so in terms of the model, it breaks down into these four functions. Yes? Is there one change, is there one change per time, or is there a series of micro steps per time? Right, so, is there one, all right, between any two panels, there will be, let's say, maybe 3,000 micro steps. Any micro step is one change, either network or behavior for one actor. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So how um, how those changes occur? Okay. The rules that actors follow in determining: Well, do I want to reciprocate a tie? Do I want to add a transitive tie? Do I want to drop a tie? Those are all going to be determined by the network objective function. Okay, and then the rules about whether or not actors increase their behavior or decrease or stay the same are ruled by the network or the behavior objective function. Okay, and then we have a couple of parallel um, functions that go with these that simply indicate the timing. Okay, so how often is an, is an actor chosen to be able to make a, cha a change to their network? The behavior rate function determines how often an actor is chosen to change their behavior. <clears throat> All right, so here's what our, our network objective function looks like. Um, 
what we're really saying is that okay, actors are evaluating this function. When they, when they go on to, to, to decide what change they're going to make to their network, they're going to look out and evaluate all potential ties. <clears throat> okay. And they're going to evaluate the network based upon a series of parameter estimates and a series of effects, these SKI that take into account X, the network. Okay, so it's, <clears throat> um, and what we're going to do is have a number of K effects that we'll, we'll go through here. Okay, and then we've got some error terms that we'll, I'm not going to really get into. Um, the goal of the model is to estimate the strength of these parameters. That's really what we want to know, is how, how important are each of these different kinds of effects in driving network change behavior or change in um, behavior. Okay. So now we're going to get really into the just nitty gritty of the model for, for an example here. Okay. So here we have a hypothetical model okay, where we have an out degree effect and a reciprocity effect. Um, the out degree effect is simply controlling for the density of the network. It's similar to an edges term in an, in an ergon model. Um, <clears throat> so it's an overall tendency to, to send ties kind of oblivious to anything happening in the network. The reciprocity effect is, if we look at it here, it's simply the sum of ties I sends to J and sum of ties that were there were the ties in the other direction from J to I. So it's a reciprocated, a reciprocated tie. And what we want to do is <clears throat> for, for the ego who's chosen to make a change to their network, ego is going to evaluate every possible tie using this equation right here. Okay? These are the current parameter estimates and these are the effects, um, the associated effects. All right, so here we have ego and what ego is going to do is consider there's a tie to, to um, alter one. Ego is going to decide, do I want to keep that tie? Okay, keep that tie or drop it. <coughs> Ego also has a tie to J2. Ego is going to consider dropping the tie, keeping the tie. Over here for J3 and J4, Ego is deciding, do I want to add that tie? Okay, so Ego is going to compare the contribution to this function of each of those changes in a tie. Okay? And compare that to, well, what, what's, the, what's the utility of making no change at all? Okay. So we can work out the math here. All right. If ego makes no change, then ego has two ties. Okay. Our current parameter estimate is negative two. That's going to contribute negative four to this, to this function. <clears throat> ego currently has one reciprocated tie. So we multiply that times the current estimate. We get 1.8. Sum that up. Okay. The current network um, is contributing to this function negative 2.2. Okay. Now, I, I, on its own, that negative 2.2 is really meaningless. Okay. It only becomes meaningful when we start to consider other possible options. Okay. So, if ego, who has a tie to J1, drops that tie, we see that the utility is negative 2. Okay. Same thing if, uh, well, if ego drops the tie to J2, that utility is negative 0.2. Okay? And why, the reason that's the case is that's an unreciprocated tie. Okay? <clears throat> ego values reciprocity. Okay? So dropping that tie really doesn't um, affect ego's utility in terms of reciprocity because it's non-reciprocated. <clears throat> the reason dropping it is kind of valuable is that there's this negative out degree effect. Having ties is costly, okay? So we're not going to have ties unless they contribute something through some other, some other um, effect in the model, okay? <clears throat> so keeping that tie to J2 doesn't make a whole lot of sense from Ego's perspective. The other possibilities are adding the tie to J3 or adding the tie to J4. Um, J3 would be reciprocated. Okay, so that's, that's kind of nice, but it's also adding another tie, which is costly. And on whole, that doesn't um, produce as much benefit. Okay, so ultimately, you know, after Ego goes through all of these, we find which option has the most, the greatest value, 
Okay, these are all negative, but the greatest value comes here, dropping the unreciprocated tie to J2. Okay, so that's, that's the decision that J2 is most likely to make. There's some error introduced to this to make it stochastic. So that we don't see the same exact sequence of, of changes every time we, we, we run through it. Okay, but most likely, Eagle's going to drop this tie to J2. All, right. All of this was one micro step. All right, thank, thank goodness the computer's doing this for us. Um, <clears throat> All right, so some of the effects that we would include in this function, we want to have an out degree effect to, to control for the overall likelihood of, of observing ties. This is usually negative. Um, kind of the, the baseline model predicts that, you know, gives, flips a coin for each, each tie, right? And we don't, we don't usually have networks that have um, half the ties present. So this network, negative out degree effect is usually going to bias the, the um, number of edges down to below 50%. Okay. We control for network processes like reciprocity and transitivity, and we can think of all, all kinds of um, with transitivity, especially all kinds of different kinds of triadic um, processes that might be going on that we want to control for. Um, when it comes to attributes, okay, where, where health behaviors and other kinds of behaviors come in, <coughs> We control for how they might affect individuals' tendency to send ties, okay. um, kind of an out degree effect, incoming ties or popularity, and then homophily on those attributes. Okay. Now for attributes, you know, we're moving into a kind of longitudinal model. Okay. So many of these attributes may be changing over time, and we can allow that to occur. We can have things changing exogenously, um, or, or behaviors and, and attributes changing endogenously through peer influence or other kinds of um, effects. And we can also include dyadic attributes. So anything kind of at the, at the relational level, co-membership or kind of some kind of distance function between individuals, things like that. All right, now a lot of these processes have analogs in an ergum model, okay? So if it, if it looks like that, it's, it's different terminology. Um, but it's the same kind of ideas of, of, of different ways that um, individuals may be related to one another. All right, now I want to move and start talking about the behavior function. All right, now it's called a behavior function, um, but it's really any kind of individual attribute that changes. Okay. Now, we don't actually have to have one of these in a, in a Sienna model. Sienna models were actually developed, you know, the first iterations of the Sienna model were just models of network change. Um, but there's so much interest in behavior change and it's a kind of a, in, in some ways a simple extension to the model given its actor oriented nature that we can put that on top of there. Okay. But you don't actually need, I, I've, actually, I've, I've run a bunch of um, models and done studies that don't consider behavior change at all a lot of things just looking at the network. Um, one of the drawbacks is that currently behaviors need to be measured as an ordinal, on an ordinal scale. So something like one, two, three, four, five, not, not uh, no decimal points in there. Um, that's because individuals are changing kind of one, one step at a time here. There is some work um, looking that, that's developing kind of continuous measures of behavior. It looks promising, so hopefully this isn't a constraint for too long. Okay. Typically, our goal in the behavior function is to estimate the effect of the network on behavior change. That's really kind of the only reason you would use a Siena framework for estimating behavior change, um, given, the, given the, this other constraint. <clears throat> All right. Now, the model itself, the behavior model, is, is really a multinomial um, logit model. Okay, we've got these different kind of ordinal values, and we're trying to um, predict which level actors will choose over time. Okay, we have a similar objective function for the behavior. The difference is we, we have the network X, but we also have um, the behavior itself, Z, in here. Okay. And the goal here is to determine for an actor who's at a particular point in time at a certain level, where do they 
change their behavior. Okay, what's driving that behavior change? So for example here, we've got some variable factors right here. During a, a, <clears throat> one of these micro steps, the actor's going to decide, do I want to stay here? Do I want to jump down one unit? Or do I want to jump up one unit? Okay, so actors evaluate these three options, make that choice. Yeah? So, uh, at the moment, we're only able to constrain a lot of choice, but I thought larger interfaces are only on the scale. But, uh, so basically, what, at least when we look at that, that basically means we're just evaluating these three choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, these three choices, um, <clears throat> and it's really evaluating them separately. It's the going down versus staying the same, and it's going up versus staying the same. Um, and then, yeah, actors get multiple choices, so we, we can see someone jump up at one point in time, jump up at another point in time, jump up, um, but it's taken one, one step at a time. Okay, in fact, that we want to include, we want to somehow control for the overall distribution. Um, so we have two terms, a linear term and quadratic term that account for, um, you can think of these as intercepts. They, can, they, they account for kind of the general tendency to have certain levels of the behavior. Um, having both a linear and quadratic term allows for a um, <clears throat> nonlinear distribution. Okay, so we have a bimodal distribution of a behavior. Something like smoking, you tend to have smokers and non-smokers. Okay, this very U-shaped distribution. Um, having both of those allows us to, to, to model that better. The predictors generally we're interested in are peer influence. Okay, so how alters behavior um, affects individuals' behavior. So we have multiple ways that we can measure alters' behavior. Uh, kind of raw levels of alters' behavior. We could measure alters' behavior relative to egos. We could weight alters behavior by how many friends there are. Um, okay, so we could do a lot of different specifications of that. But that's generally the effect that um, we're interested in estimating. We can also control for effects of network structure, absent content. So things like in-degree, kind of more, more embedded actors uh, may have different behavior than those who are, uh, have fewer, um, fewer partners or maybe isolates. <clears throat> We can control for whether ties are reciprocated um, and how that, that affects the behavior. We can also control for other behaviors or, or attributes of ego. Okay, so in, in, in predicting something like a health outcome, we'd want to control for socioeconomic status, uh, maybe age and race and some, a, a few other things, kind of just like um, traditional linear models. Okay. All right, so here is a very simple um, behavior function. Okay. It's going to include two effects to control for distribution, the, the, the linear and the quadratic effects. <clears throat> Effect of some attribute, that ego, uh, one of ego's own attributes, and then this peer influence effect. Okay. That's where the, the network comes in here at the end. And taking into account each of these, ego is going to decide how attractive is each um, level of the behavior, which, which direction is ego going to go. Now these first three effects are really easy to evaluate. Okay, so ego has three choices. Right? Let's say ego is at ego's at level one, and ego can drop to zero or jump up to two. Okay, so we take those perspective values zero, one, two, and plug those in as ego's value in these equations. Given the current estimates, okay, we add add those in and do some math, and that's pretty straightforward. Okay. This is, I think, probably first year, um, first year stats in terms of just predicting, um, predicting values from here. Okay. The similarity effect is where it starts to get tedious. Okay. So I've got an example of what that might look like. Okay. This total similarity effect, okay. this is how ego is considering all of the alters. Um, we take, we calculate the similarity between um, I and each J, okay, and that similarity itself is, it's the absolute difference, okay, divided by 
the range, the maximum range of their difference, and subtract it from one. Okay, what this does is it takes that difference and it puts it on a scale from zero to one and, and flips, flips the direction so that zero is maximum dissimilarity, one is maximum similarity. Yeah? And similarity is just the maximum number of them all, sort of like a, like, if you're doing a or something like that? It, it, it is, um, and it's, yeah, I, I think about it kind of dyad at a time. Um, so, how similar are we? We'll do some math to figure out how similar we are, but then we'll go through every, every one of my J's and figure out how similar am I to that person. And with the total similarity, we sum that up. Okay. So here we are giving some weight to um, whether or not someone has a lot of friends or someone has, has few friends. Okay. So we're going to calculate um, total similarity. <clears throat> This walks through the math of how to do that, of ego calculating the similarity with every, every alter. Um, we see here, in the end, similarity is only calculated for i and j, because those are the only two that ego ha is actually friends with. Anyone who ego is not friends with drops out of, of the calculations. Okay. So for ego, if ego is going to stay here at behavior level one, the similarity statistic sums up to 0.9. Okay. And I don't know if it's clear here, J2 has a value of one, J1 also has a value of one. Okay, so we could do this again for the decision to decrease down to zero. Okay, and we see that when we do, do the math, we actually get a value of negative 0.1. Okay, so that's, that's lower than what we had before. Um, ego is, by dropping down to zero, is becoming more dissimilar. And if we increase um, to two, actually the similarity statistic winds up being the same because we're moving the same distance away from our alters, just in the opposite direction. Okay, so, <clears throat> We can plug in those similarity statistics here, um, calculate the sum, and get an idea of which behavior ego is going to choose. Okay. Oh, that got all off, didn't it? I don't want to even do that. All right. So let's look at these, um, kind of what they're doing. Okay, so the linear and quadratic terms, if you sum those up, we get a zero, we get a negative 0.5 plus 0.25 is negative 0.25, and then negative one and one. Okay, so those across the three choices give us this kind of distribution, where being at zero or two is a little bit higher than being at one. Okay, so the, the combination of the linear and quadratic terms kind of pulls ego towards one of the two extremes. Okay, the effect of age, the coefficient's positive, and when we work through the math, we see that <clears throat> um, higher levels of smoking are given greater weight. So the effect of age is also to pull ego um, higher, okay? push ego towards, towards smoking. And then the effect of these similarity statistics is actually kind of this reverse, um, inverse U shape. Okay. These push ego to stay at the same level as, um, as his friends. Okay. When we do it all together, we see that kind of ego is most likely to kind of increase smoking behavior, slightly less likely to stay at the same behavior. <clears throat> ego will most likely do this, but again, there's some stochasticity in there, so ego might stay at one, might, um, might jump up to two. All right, so again, this is one micro step, okay? You go going through and making all of these, all of these calculations and, and changing um, his behavior, okay? Um, all right, now let me just say, you know, spend one slide on, on rate functions. Um, we, oh, sorry. Right, so the model only allows um, movements of one, of one unit, 
Okay, so ego would jump to one, and then the next time, you know, ego is chosen again for, for this kind of change, um, would go through this process again. If the, the network stayed the same and alters behavior stayed the same, then this would apply. Um, Before you see that uh, ego jumps, skips a category and goes to point zero, do we stop by the presumption of? Um, oh, okay. So you're saying if ego has behavior zero here and two up here. Yeah, yeah. So we do see that a lot. Uh, it, it doesn't violate the assumptions, but what that does is that if we see a lot of change from one time point to the next, we're going to need probably a lot of, a lot of these micro steps because um, ego will need to be um, selected twice to change their behavior. So at some point, they go up to one. We're not going to observe that, but the model is assuming that there's this kind of increase across, across levels and at some point get up to two. Now, you know, it, there will be multiple instances of change. So it could be that ego changes to one, changes back to zero, changes to one, and then ultimately ends up at two. Um, so we're allow we are allowing for kind of multiple kinds of changes to occur. Yeah, yeah. So that, that decision, uh, if, if this category, if, if the behavior variable is continuous, and I have to categorize it, will, will affect the change rate? It would affect um, the rate of observed change. Um, and it, it would affect the scaling. Would it, I'm not sure if it would affect the scaling of the parameters themselves. So, um, yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So I would typically look, look at the distribution of, of variable. Um, and you know, I, what I found works best is somewhere between, you need at least two, two levels. Um, getting up more than 10, um, changes don't seem to be as meaningful. So somewhere between two and 10 um, has seemed to work best. Um, what I think is important is that you, you, you really want to capture change that's meaningful. You know, little, you know, minor fluctuations from one time point to the, to the other may be just simply some kind of, kind of error, measurement error. You really want to capture change that is meaningful. And so where is that meaningful change? Um, I'll typically look for kind of, you know, points in a, in a distribution. Um, you know, if you've got something bimodal, you know, you, you've got low levels, high levels, and something in between. If you've got a you know, more normal distribution, you can think, okay, there are really extremes here that we want to, that are distinct from people somewhere, different places in the middle. Um, you know, I think that part, I think there's a little more art there than, than you know, hard, fast rules. I know some people, you know, kind of use z-score cutoffs and just put people into these bins, and, I, and that seems to be, um, that works fine sometimes as well, um, but I don't know if there's any you know, rules saying do it one way or the other. The main thing I think is again capture these, you know, what are qualitative differences in levels of the behavior, and you want to observe people transitioning across those. In the lab, <coughs> there's a, a brief bit about just looking at the distribution of behaviors and um, the, the distribution across time, and how how many people stay the same, how many people jump from one category to the other. You know, for the model to estimate, you need some shifts in behavior over time. Um, you need some variance to explain. <clears throat> but you don't want to, you know, too much that it's just kind of random, kind of jumping around. So it's finding, I don't know, there's, again, it's an art to finding that right balance. Uh, okay. All right, the, the rate functions, the main point of the rate functions is to determine um, how often actors change their behavior, how often actors change their network. Okay. It's um, kind of a function of the amount of observed change between um, 
the waves of data, but it's not directly um, interpretable in, in, in terms of that. It's really, the rate functions are interpreted in terms of how many microsteps there are. So the rate function is how many, is, is essentially how many opportunities each actor gets to change their network or to change their behavior. Okay, and we have one for network change, another one for behavior change, um, and they're usually different in scale. So most often what we see is that there's a lot more network change than there is behavior change. So these rate functions for networks tend to be much higher than the rate functions for, for behavior. Um, we, we generally assume that every individual has the same kind of waiting time, the same rate of change, but we could model, if we think there are differences, um, some, some kinds of people are, change their friendships more frequently, change their ties more frequently, we could model that, or some people are, change their behavior more, we can also, also model, model that. Okay. All right, so, Moving on to estimation. Again, the goal here is to just get you thinking. Yes? Right, right. So that, that is getting to one of the assumptions of the model is that actors, you know, whether or not they evaluate, they, the model assumes they evaluate all their ties. Kind of conceptually what that means is kind of one is aware of the entire network. And I think, you know, as networks get larger in size, that certainly becomes less, less tenable. Um, and so for that reason, I think it, it, you know, that there is a maximum kind of size network that one, one wants to look at around 2,000 or so. The model also tends to bog down at that point. Um, in terms of laziness, so you're really talking about some actor level heterogeneity in... Um, I assume this thing just kind of happened to people. Maybe if they're, if they're smoking, they just kind of keep smoking more. Mm -hmm. Or maybe like, maybe it's that if a computer was like a decision or a choice, if you don't have time like that, Right, well, I think one part of your, your question um, is there is some heterogeneity in the importance of these processes. So, for instance, homophily may be really important for some people, you know, and not, not important at all for other, other people. And, the, the, you know, the, kind of the default assumption is that it's, you know, this, this same race effect that we want to model has the same effect across individuals. And so we've got some kind of, kind of error um, by estimating that. Now, if we could somehow measure that, we could include that individual level laziness or preference for homophily or um, <clears throat> you know, what, whatever we think is at the root of that. We could include that as a moderator of a lot of these effects, um, which might get it um, at, at some of that. Currently, um, yeah, we, we otherwise can't really get at that.
Yeah, yeah. And actually, that, re that reminds me of a, a, of a development in the works, which is, is um, called the settings kind of model, which will allow actors to kind of, you know, kind of look first or look more often for um, alters who are within some common setting. Um, and that seems to fit a lot better. Things like schools where you kind of, most of your friends are drawn from the same grade. You look first for friends there um, before looking outside the grade. So you can include a, a grade effect on its own, but it works a little bit differently than, than that model does. So all right, great question. Are we good? All right. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to, I'm going to go through this briefly. Um, and the main reason is, um, so you understand kind of what's happening as you're sitting there waiting for the model to run, um, which can, <laughs> can take a while. We'll keep it short in the lab, but realistically it gets, um, it takes a while. Okay, and, and also in terms of di diagnosing the model is important. Okay, so the way the model works is for, for each effect you include in the model, <clears throat> there is a target statistic. Okay, so simple example is we include reciprocity in the model. There's a target statistic that's the number of reciprocated ties. And what estimation is trying to do is to find you know, parameter estimates that when you let the model run and you measure the, the number of reciprocated ties at the end, it matches that target statistic. Okay, so we're trying to match the target statistic for every effect included in the model. <clears throat> okay. Um, and those target statistics are the, the, the effects summed across time to and on. Okay, we're taking time one, conditioning on time one, and letting everything go from there. Okay, the estimation algorithm itself has three subphases. Okay, phase one, we're going to initialize some starting values for parameters, some provisional values, and um, just to get started. Step two. Um, is the most lengthy. It uses this simulation algorithm. Um, goes through a number of simulation, number of simulations to try to get parameter estimates that are a little bit better. Okay, so we'll take these provisional estimates, run with those, see how close it gets to target statistics, adjust things a little bit, try it again. Okay, you do that a large, large number of times. Okay, and once we get some decent statistics, then we have a, another phase, phase three, that takes those estimated parameters, holds them fixed, and then simulates the model um, a couple thousand times and gets some standard errors for our, for our effects. All right, here's actually the algorithm broken down. I'm not going to walk through it, but you can, you can study it later. The main thing to note is that it's a circle, okay? And we just keep doing the same thing over and over again. All right, and at some point, we'll jump out and, and report some results, okay? Um, oh, okay, I'll point out one box here. Um, <clears throat> the first step of the simulation is, um, again, based on this, this rate function, we're gonna pick someone. Um, we're gonna assign everybody at, 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 at kind of a random time based on these functions and pick someone, and they're gonna change their network or their behavior, okay? Do all this for that person and then come back and pick Again, maybe rarely it'll be the same person, but occasionally that can happen. Um, but we're going to go through and pick actors and have, um, you know, usually thousands of micro steps. Okay. All right, so once we've estimated um, the model, a couple of um, steps. First, we want to check for convergence. Okay, and the real the idea here is is the model able to reproduce those target statistics? Okay. It's not going to reproduce them exactly, but what we want is the, that the, the model produces a distribution that's centered on those target statistics and, and not really too far, too far off. And we've got some, st some statistics that help to evaluate how close we're getting. Okay, so that's the first step when we've estimated a model is check, check for convergence. If it didn't converge, we can um, try rerunning the model and using the current estimates as starting values. Um, it just might take while to hone in on the right set of parameters. We do that a few times and it's not working. That tells us that there's something wrong with our model. It's just not a very good model for that data set. And we want to rethink, um, rethink what we're doing. Okay. 
if we have convergence, um, we can look at, start looking at the results, um, but pretty, pretty quickly we, we want to also start looking at goodness of fit and look at how well are we able to um, kind of reproduce the network. Did, did, um, did you get to goodness of fit yesterday in Ergos? I left early. Okay. It's kind of the same idea, right? We're looking at how well the model is able to reproduce um, aspects of the network that aren't explicitly modeled, okay? So some of these, some of these distributions. Um, different from the ergum, though, is that we also want to look at some of the um, distributions for behavior and make sure we're, we're able to recreate those. All right. Um, do we need a quick break? Um, I have an example next that gets tedious, so. Right, right. Um, it's generally, uh, I think I'll, I'll have an example of this later, but I, it, it's the same kind of framework as it's really difficult to get, you know, great, perfect fit of a model. And you run the risk of almost overfitting your model when you do that. Um, you, you know, you want to get a distribution that's close um, on most of these that captures the, you know, the general shape of these distributions. Yeah, but we, and, and like with the ergum, <laughs> yeah, you, and you can, you can tweak things to get better, but it, mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I think striving for perfection is, okay. isn't going too far. Um, yeah, all right. Well, let's just take a couple of minutes then um, before I, I, I get into this um, for a little break. Currently, so you, you the models take a long time because of all these micro steps in two of the phases, right? Um, but it's, um, you can do some of this in parallel. So having a computer with a, a number of cores, you can split up um, at least some of, the, some of, the, some of it, which, which helps. Um, so I have a you know, computer with multiple cores and then multiple computers. Um, and that's, yeah. <laughs> but we're still looking at, I mean, sometimes half a day to run a model, sometimes a little bit longer. The more complex, the, so you know, th this gets into a point about model fitting, though, and is, is that if you put every effect possible in a model, you know, because every effect goes into every calculation, it takes forever to model. So you really want to be um, kind of conscientious about estimating a model. And there are ways to um, kind of provisionally test which effects you might want to include. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think I get to that in the lab. Um, so that you're not just throwing everything in. And then, instead of throwing everything in and pulling out what's non-significant, you want to kind of slowly build up, um, including effects that are either kind of, of greatest theoretical or, or methodological importance first. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that you had a computer with multiple cores. If you did that in R, does it take advantage of that automatically, or do you have to instruct it on how to there, Yeah, there's a, there's a, a couple of con, con, uh, commands in the uh, script um, when, you, when you run the model. So if I don't have that in there, I can certainly um, tell you how to do it. Yeah? Will this work on isometric graphs? Right. Um, it, it will. The, the big um, kind of question there is the assumption that actors control their outgoing ties. And so what does that really mean for a non-directed network? Um, and so um, there's, a, there's a couple of ways to do this. One is kind of to, uh, and it's been, it's been a while since I've looked at this, but kind of actors provisionally send a tie and it, and it kind of has to be confirmed by the person you want to provisionally send a tie to. Um, and I think there's another way that you can actually dictate a tie, but again, that's really, um, that's making an assumption that one, one party can dictate that there's a, a tie between, you know, that, that's in fact, <clears throat> but yes, you can. So don't don't rule it out for that. So. All right. So let's go through an example here um, from from Ad Health, and this is the the network that I showed you earlier. And I think we all have um, at least heard Ad Health. Um, 
spoken about a few times. With, with Sienna models, we're really restricted to looking at the saturated schools, which are the schools that at, um, for the wave one and wave two in-home interviews, um, they really targeted every student in the school. And there are 16 schools where they targeted every student um, for, um, for network data collection, so we really have complete network data. Uh, there's one of those schools um, that I, I, I think is a special needs population and really doesn't um, work for much modeling. A lot of the others are small schools. Um, there are, are two large high schools where you see most of the um, network, um, kind of longitudinal network um, projects using data from. <clears throat> and there's another middle school I think that's, that's sizable as well. The rest are quite small. Um, but if you're thinking about using ad health data, it's really those 15 schools, um, but there's a lot of heterogeneity in those 15 schools as well. So I could talk at length, at length about those, but let's talk about Sienna instead. Um, and I don't know how much of this is, is, is necessary. You know, in, in looking at a Sienna model and just trying to understand coefficients, think about an ergum or think about a logistic regression. We're really predicting the, the log odds of a tie. Okay, and how does this effect predict the log odds of a tie? Kind of keeping in the back of your mind that here we're studying change over time. Okay, that we're really looking at change in ties over time, not just what's there, what's present and absent. Okay, um, so some of these you can convert into odds, if you like. If a one unit change, it's the effect of a one unit change on the outcome, all else being equal. Um, but all else is never equal, okay? And so the way to think about this is, <clears throat> you know, if you're thinking about adding a tie versus dropping a tie, and what's the effect of reciprocity? All right, well, one unit change in reciprocity, you can either it's right, reciprocated or not. That's easy to understand. But when you add a tie, you're also affecting the out degree statistic. Okay? You're increasing the number of ties by one. And if there are other effects in the model, you're likely changing all those other effects as well. Okay, so. <clears throat> It's really never the case that all else is equal. Some of those effects you really need to take into account more when talking about one unit changes. But for, you know, for all these reasons, I try not to talk about, convert these into odds, even though lots of people want to talk about, talk about odds. Okay, so I've got a model here, and I'm just gonna walk through a bunch of different effects in the model and try to help, un, help, help explain kind of how to interpret these effects. Okay, and <clears throat> for each effect, um, when you set up a Sienna model to specify an effect, um, they all have these short names um, that, that can be used to, to identify an effect and tell the model include it or test it or something. I'll include the short name here. The rate effect, um, here we're looking at the network of functions. Time to see if this works. Yeah, it's not. All right. Um, this tells us that each actor has about 10 micro steps to make a change. Okay, so 10 actors. I think this is a model of about 500 folks, so that works out to be about 5,000 micro steps just for for network change. All right. Rate effects really not not usually interesting to talk about um, when interpreting a model. Um, out degree effect, um, negative out degree effect, so ties are going to be unlikely. Um, in the model itself, this is called density. Okay, when you, you don't even need to specify it, it's automatically included, but if you ever need to refer to it, um, maybe set a value or something, it's the density effect. And it's really, <clears throat> this is, this is the, uh, the statistic. Now someone had the question earlier about target statistics and statistics in that are in the model. It's, it's maybe somewhat confusing because this, this is the target statistic. If we sum this across all eyes, every actor in the model, how many, um, how many ties each eye has, that's the target statistic that we're trying to, to recreate with the model. It's also the statistic that, that is used to calculate um, changes in the network. Okay? It's just that in that case, it's just for the particular eye that's chosen. It's the sum of how many ties they have. Okay. All right, now let's get to some effects that are worth interpreting. Um, reciprocity, um, 1.9, that's a pretty common, common value. Um, 
interest in these networks, friendship type networks. Okay. I'm just going to power through some of these that I think are more basic. But if you have questions, let me know. Our measure of transitivity is this transitive triplets effect. Um, so it's really, for any i, how many ties from i to j, i to h, and h to j. So um, <clears throat> this positive effect here means that um, any ties that contribute more transitive triplets, okay, not necessarily saying, you know, where in this triplet i is. Uh, it could be the tie from i to j, or it could be the tie from i to h that's being added. We're not necessarily distinguishing where in, in <coughs> the triad ego is, okay? But ties that add more of those are going to be more likely to be, to be added, okay? Now, since I created this slide and ran this model, so there's some work so showing that oftentimes there's an, an interaction between reciprocity and transitive triplets. Um, okay, both of those are pretty strong effects at least in friendship networks. Um, and their effect is not necessarily additive. Okay, usually transitive, transitivity or reciprocity is sufficient alone. Is, 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 you know, not, maybe not quite completely sufficient, but contributes a lot to the likelihood of a tie. So it's really a good idea to include that interaction. And usually, interaction is usually going to be negative. Okay, it's not, it just means that they're not completely additive. Okay, in degree, popularity, John mentioned this. So this is our ties to folks with lots of incoming ties, um, more likely. Okay. And our positive coefficient suggests yes, that actors here are more likely to choose those folks who many others have chosen as well. Okay, so this is one example of, of a, of a degree-related effect. We might also want to test whether people who send lots of ties are more likely to kind of keep sending ties over time, um, uh, <clears throat> as well as some other kinds of, we, we, we could look at whether individuals who um, have many incoming ties are also likely to send large numbers of outgoing ties. Okay, there's a few different ways of looking at, looking at this. All right, next we have a dyadic covariate. Um, so here, extracurricular activity overlap is coded as a, it's a one-mode network. Um, coded one if two students were in the same activity and zero if they weren't in at least one of the same activities. And we see that uh, positive effect here, yes, activities tend to support friendships. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so for covariates, um, we, we want to include typically a, different, a number of different effects. Okay, we want to include this ego effect here, which controls for out degree or sociality. The alter effect controls for the effect of the covariate on incoming ties okay, or popularity. And then some version of um, homophily. Okay, in this case, it's, it's similarity. Okay. <clears throat> so we've got these for, um, I'm skipping smoking for the time being, but for females and age, Delinquency, alcohol, and GPA. Um, and for each of these, <clears throat> we really think homophily is the main control that we're interested in. Um, because homophily is so powerful. We really want to control for that. But to get good estimates of homophily, we want to also control for ego and alter effects. And the reason being, if, if, if some kinds of individuals are just really more likely to send ties, Okay, let's just, let's say, for instance, maybe we've, we've got a female alter effect here that's negative. Okay, let's say females um, are just really unattractive as friends. Okay, I personally don't believe that, but that's what the model's saying. Um, we, we would see most ties among boys, right? Nobody's choosing girls. Most of the ties are going to be among boys. Everybody's choosing boys. We might see an inflated homophily effect. Okay, so controlling for these ego and alter effects give us a better estimate of Similarity. And in fact, we have some nonlinear versions of ego and alter that look like it's, it's important to control for, for possible nonlinearities as well to really understand that, that topology. Okay. Um, and I don't, let's see, this model does not control for race homophily. This is a predominantly white school, but um, typically we would want to include race ethnic homophily. And for that, 
we could use this similarity effect, which as I talked about earlier is a kind of an absolute difference effect and it could work. But for really for categorical kinds of attributes, we want to use the same version, um, which, which looks at just ego and alter. Do they have the same value or are they different? Um, it's the same with, with ergums. It, it's the difference between a node, a node match and an absolute difference kind of effect. You want to make the same difference here. So treat attributes differently if they're continuous versus um, categorical. Okay. All right, now I want to look at smoking. Um, <clears throat> and really dive into how to interpret these effects. Um, and in particular, this, this similarity effect, this homophily effect. <clears throat> we need to kind of be careful when interpreting homophily effects along with ego and alter effects because this similarity effect is really a, a kind of an interaction between ego and alter. You know, it's how similar are ego, ego and alter. And interpreting that, we also want to take into account main effects. Okay? Just like when interpreting interactions, you want to include main effects. So the simplest way to do that is to calculate predicted contributions to the network function given ego and alter smoking levels. Okay. So here we have a simple, simplified table that just looks at non-smokers and smokers and calculates, okay, for a non-smoker, and let's say they're choosing a non-smoker as a friend, let's plug in you know, a non-smoker value of zero into here, smoking alter value of zero, and a similarity value of, this would be one, plug those in and calculate how much that contributes to to the network function. And we do that for each combination and can calculate how likely is this type of dyad um, and compare it with the other, the other types of dyads. Um, and it's actually, it's a little bit more complicated in that these effects are centered automatically by Sienna. Behavior effects have to be centered and so you have to take that into account when doing the math. Um, but it works out to be, we see here, there is some homophily on smoking um, but we see a real, um, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit stronger for smokers than for non-smokers. But we also see this asymmetry, okay, where smokers are really unlikely to choose non-smokers. Non-smokers are only slightly less likely to choose smokers as friends. So we can, we can pick up that, um, that a little bit. All right, so I'd recommend anytime there's, you know, you really have a homophily effect of interest and there's some ego and alter effect that, Take, take these extra steps to go through it to really to know if um, you know what, what it looks like in the equation is really what's what's happening on paper or or at the dyad level. Okay. All right. Now turning to the behavior function. Um, so here again, we start with the rate effect, and we see this is quite smaller. Only two opportunities on average to change. Um, to change one's smoking behavior. It doesn't take a whole lot to, to get to um, what we observe changing over time. Okay. We have a linear and quadratic shape, which <clears throat> controls for the overall distribution of, smoke, or of smoking. And interpreting these, I, again, I don't think it's usually that, Im it's not that interesting because it's really, this is a control. Um, but it's, it's important to kind of understand what's, what's happening. Um, so these two kind of need to be interpreted in conjunction. And it's not always easy, again, because smoking is going to be centered. So how does a negative linear combine with a much, much greater positive quadratic in, in this um, covariate that's centered? It's not always easy to do that in one's head. So you can do the same thing where you calculate the contribution to the behavior function for each level of the behavior to understand kind of the base propensity to shift to um, smoking zero versus one versus two. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now this um, this may be a good point to, to, to point out that these linear and quadratic shapes again they don't they don't necessarily say anything about change. Right? We are modeling change over time. But they're not telling us kind of what they're telling us is where people tend to change to. Okay, people tend to change to here or change to up here, much more than 
kind of staying or moving towards the middle. All right, so they're, but they're not telling us necessarily which direction people are changing. And, and that's a, a lot of times um, kind of people mis misinterpret these kinds of effects. Um, it's not a tendency to increase one's smoking over time. Okay, so positive value here doesn't mean people tend to increase over time. And negative value doesn't mean people tend to decrease. What it means is that people tend to either move towards or stay at certain levels or, or points on distribution. Okay. okay, here um, we have an ego covariate um, to delinquency. Um, so delinquents are more likely to <coughs> have higher levels of smoking, either move to higher levels, adopt higher levels, or stay at higher levels of smoking. Okay. Um, average similarity, this is where we bring in the peers. This is different from the, the total similarity that I walked through earlier um, in that we're not counting the number of peers. We're counting the average across one's friends, um, the average similarity across one's friends. And the positive value indicates that we do, we do see some evidence of peer influence. And again, I, I didn't make this clear earlier, but this is a tendency to either move, change one's behavior to be closer to one's friends, or to stay at a level of behavior that is closer to one's friends, okay? Um, all right, we have a couple other effects that aren't significant, measure of in-degree, so are popular kids more likely to smoke? Um, and we don't see any, any evidence of that. So any, any tendency for popular kids to smoke seems to be dr driven by the network dynamics, okay? And that, that is, pop kids who are smoking are more likely to be selected as friends. All right, now I want to move on to goodness of fit. Um, and I, I think I'm going to go quick through this because, again, it was, it was covered yesterday. And it's really not, not that much different. Yes? So the average uh, go back. effect, yeah. So, uh, so this is telling you about the tendency to move towards the average behavior of your users. But you don't know if you're moving up or down, right? Right, right. Did you peek ahead in the slides? That's, that's coming up. <laughs> yes, you can. Okay. Yeah, it, I'll, I'll get to that in an example in a minute. Yeah, that's a great, in, yeah. Oh, great, great question. Right, so these are, um, this model is just time one to time two, there's nothing else. But if we had multiple waves, we could, um, the, the, the default model is to, um, what, I guess, constraint effects to be equal for each transition. But you can bring in um, effects for if there's heterogeneity in time, or if you want to test whether an effect is stronger, maybe at certain time points, than another. Um, and of course, Dan, Dan Reagan has done some really cool stuff on that that, that um, everyone should look at, looking at changes in peer influence and changes in selection across, across time. Um, yeah. All right. So, yeah, let me move on. I'm going to skip through this because I think the examples are much more important um, than good as a fit. Um, again, these aren't, that looks pretty good, right? Until you look down here and see a P, a value of zero, saying, no, this doesn't fit at all. But, you know, it's, it's pretty good for, simple model like this, okay? Um, triad census fits, actually fits, go figure. Um, all right, and um, this is, the one difference from the ergot is that you can look at the distribution of um, behaviors. Um, this is just how many are in each category. That's such a simple statistic that it should fit. Um, we'd be really in trouble if it didn't. But there are more sophisticated statistics that we'll get to in the lab that I think are more. Um, more worthwhile. Okay, there are a number of ways to extend this basic model. Um, so I've been talking about just smoking in the network, but you could really have a number of behaviors if you wanted to look at smoking and drinking, both as outcomes, along with network change over time, you could. 
Um, you could bring in additional kinds of behaviors if you wanted to and look at, really the reason to do that would be if you think that smoking behavior affects drinking behavior or vice versa. There's some kind of um, endogenous effects there. Um, you know, a number of other kinds of ways to extend this. Um, but let's get to the example here, all right? So this is the question um, about, is, is it possible to detect asymmetric peer influence? Okay, so <clears throat> the implicit assumption with, with the model that I've gone through so far is that um, effects on behavior matter the same for increases as for decreases. And the corollary with the network is that effects have the same strength for adding a tie as they do for deleting a tie. And, um, you know, that may or may not be realistic. Um, for smoking, it, it, well, the, one, the reason to make that assumption is if you don't, you've, you've got two different models, completely different models and effects. Um, it takes twice, twice the number of effects if you want to include every effect for both of those. Okay, so you, you get more power if you can make this assumption. Um, I think we'll see more and more work looking at whether, where, where it um, holds versus where it doesn't. With behaviors, it seems like, you know, it, <clears throat> with smoking, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's a lot of um, reasons people smoke that are different from the reasons they start smoking in the first place, okay? So we can, we can relax this assumption and actually estimate separate models or at least separate, separate out particular effects for increases versus decreases. Um, and the way to do that is to take that, um, that network function or that behavior function and create two functions. Um, and so one is the creation function that only considers increases and the maintenance function only considers decreases. And so when we're going through, when an ego is going through kind of considering all these ties or, or behaviors, if it's an increase, if it's a potential increase or potentially adding a tie, it'll use one function. If it's a decrease or dropping a tie, it'll use a different function. And those functions are updated separately um, over time so we can get different estimates for increases versus decreases. Now it's possible in, 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 um, to um, only do this for certain effects. Okay? And so in the example I'm about to show, we, we freed the peer influence effect to, to differ between creation and, and decreases, but kept everything else um, constrained to be equal across, across the two, okay? Um, and so this is, um, with smoking, this is what we found. And these are, I, I, I turned the um, parameter estimates into these predicted contributions to um, the behavior function, because it makes it a little bit easier to, to, to interpret. Okay, and so this is, these are hypothetical situations. Ego is currently a moderate smoker, so they're in this middle category. And let's say they have non-smoking alters, okay? And they consider each possible smoking level, which is most likely, right? And we see the highest values here for zero, okay? An ego who's a moderate smoker with non-smoking alters is most likely to adopt a level of zero and, you know, less likely, less and less likely to adopt these higher levels. And these are estimates for two separate schools. That's why we have two, two lines here. Okay. Now, in <clears throat> the same ego, but whose alters smoke, we see a little bit different function, right? So ego's likelihood of staying at smoking level one is pretty, pretty low. Okay. That's pretty unattractive. They're, they may drop, they may increase. Okay. In Let's see, Jefferson, the school we were just looking at, it seems like there's a tendency to increase smoking. Um, but in another school in Adhel, Sunshine, there's a, you know, a slight tendency to, 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 to decrease there. And so what this suggests, and if we, this, this is a lot of information, but it does tell the story more quickly. For someone who's not smoking, they're really unlikely to become a smoker, okay? Unless their alters are smoking, okay? That's the situation where they start smoking, okay? But if you're a smoker, you're, <clears throat> you might quit smoking even though your friends keep smoking, okay? That's right here. If you're, let's see, 
if you're here, you might stay here or you might move over here. If you're a moderate smoker, you kind of could go in either way. Okay, so smokers tend to maybe keep smoking, maybe quit. Maybe their friends quit and they keep smoking. Okay, there's less of um, this peer influence um, among smokers than there is among non-smokers. Okay. I think it's these, these models, or separating it out like this can be, can be tougher to, to estimate. Um, Sienna models tend to have lower power for modeling behavior change. Um, there's just fewer instances of behavior change than there are for network change. So that part of the model tends to have less power. Um, and when you do something like this, you're really cutting your power even further because you're looking at increases separately from decreases. Um, so I've seen some folks try to estimate these models and they really don't have the power to do it, um, but I think it's, it's you know, a very important kind of development um, that, we can, that we can, that we should start looking at more. All right. Yes? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so there, there's not kind of formal power analysis methods um, developed yet, but I know that um, folks are working on it. And okay, you actually you get to my next, my, my very next slide. Um, because Sienna uses this simulation kind of algorithm at its heart, you can do a lot with, with those simulations. Um, you can use that part of the model, kind of um, use that part of the model to, to answer questions like that. And so the, you know, the one approach that I've seen is using simulations to try to say under, under this kind of situation, um, will we be able to, how often will we be able to detect effects? If peer influence has this strength, um, if the network kind of looks like this, um, if you know, there's this rate of missing data, um, if we have this many waves, kind of what effects will we be able to detect? And that seems the most promising strategy for, for a while. Um, but I think to do that, you, you need to start with kind of good estimates of what peer influence effects look like. So yes, Sienna as an agent-based model. Um, there's a number of reasons we might, might, might want to do this. So the goodness of fit that I skimmed through, that uses the simulation part of the model, holds the parameter estimates constant and just simulates a bunch of, a bunch of networks. You can also use it to um, um, simulate um, or decompose kind of the sources of different network patterns. Okay, and I'll, I'll have an example of that in a minute that, that tries to ascertain kind of what, what's responsible for the monopoly we observe in a network. Um, and you can also use it, kind of other reasons people use interventions or simulations. You could evaluate kind of interventions or changing the rules or changing, what if we had this same process in a different network, different context, what, what might it look like? Okay. All right, so just an example of decomposing homogeneity. Um, we could answer the question, how much homogeneity observed is due to selection? How much is due to influence? The basic kind of strategy here is um, you, know, you, you estimate a model and then let's take peer influence out of the model and simulate you know, what happens just, just based upon these selection parameters. Okay, how much homophily do we observe? Okay, now let's do the reverse. Let's take out um, the selection effects and just have peer influence simulate and see how much homophily we get in the resulting networks, okay? And then we can kind of calculate how much um, of the observed homophily that we, that we actually ob ob uh, observe from the full model is attributable to, to those, those different sources, okay? And doing that for smoking in, in a number of data sets tends to tell us that um, actually selection seems to account for either as much, if not more, of the, the homophily we see on smoking than, than influence. Okay, this is, this is the model I showed earlier. These other studies are different, different studies of smoking in, in Europe, but pretty consistent you know, evidence that there's both. Um, you know, so is smoking selection versus influence? Usually that's not a very interesting question. Usually it's both, um, and their interesting question is kind of how much of each and the, you know, getting, getting closer to the different processes that are responsible for, for each, okay? We could also estimate the importance of um, potential interventions. 
Okay, we could manipulate um, really anything in the model. Um, some things are easier than, than others to manipulate. Um, so in a kind of initial kind of proof of concept paper, um, some colleagues and I manipulated peer influence. We manipulated how popular smokers were. Um, kind of kept everything else in the model the same and then kind of looked to see how, how these different parameters, um, their strength affected the prevalence of smoking over time. Okay, and so here we see that if we, if we manipulate peer influence, but keep smoking popularity the same, there's really no effect on smoking prevalence. If we, keep, if we kept peer influence at the same level, but manipulated how popular smokers were, then we see some strong, pretty strong effects. As smokers became more popular, <clears throat> then we see more smoking. And that makes more sense, right? If smokers have more incoming ties, if more people have smokers among their, their set of alters, then there's greater capacity for, for smoking to, um, to diffuse, okay? And when we manipulate it jointly, that might be kind of hard to read, but the, the bold lines in the middle represent these. And what we basically see is, again, when smoking, um, Popularity is at its observed level, peer influence doesn't matter. But as the popularity of smokers shifts, peer influence has this effect of when smokers are popular, peer influence leads to lots of smoking. When smokers are unpopular, peer influence serves a protective function, keeps people from smoking. Okay, so the effect of some of these effects, the impact of some of these effects really depends upon what else is happening in this context. Okay. Um, I have another example here of, well, this was just one school. What if we, um, and, and in, interestingly enough, Jefferson High has the highest smoking prevalence of all the ad health schools. Um, this is not where you want your kids to be going to school. Um, so, um, you know, how much of those findings are just because this is a really high smoking prevalence? Well, with Ad Health, we've got 100 and something schools that we have, you know, baseline smoking at. We could run the same simulation across all of these different contexts and, and, and see what the impact of um, peer influence and smoking, smoking is. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that and just focus on this one real quick. Um, here we have a low smoking context situation. And what we see is that kind of regardless of how popular smokers are, as peer influence increases, prevalence decreases. Okay, so in schools with really low prevalence, you know, this would suggest that kind of smoking popularity doesn't matter, right? That peer influence is protective no matter what. In a high prevalence context, we see this opposite effect. Okay, kind of peer influence seems to be really bad thing in, in this school, no matter how popular smokers are or not, okay? So, um, you know, this is a very, very simple question, very unrealistic um, intervention, but kind of, I hope, opens your eyes to possibilities that can, that can be used. You could also do things like manipulate um, initial prevalence. You could manip you know, think about putting some kids through interventions and some kids not. I will issue one word of caution, and that is that Sienna centers things by default, and that throws off a lot of things you would want to hold constant across conditions. So if you automatically kind of got rid of half the smokers, we can make them non-smokers, and you wanted to see if that affects things, it's, it, it winds up affecting every, every effect in the model that takes into account smoking because all of a sudden it's going to be centered differently. I'll stop there. If you have questions about that, let me, let me know. Um, so. All right, so uh, let's see. I think we're about due for a break and a lab. Um, I've got a couple of slides on assumptions and missing data. Um, I'll let people ask questions if they have things about that. I do want to point out, though, some great sources of information, though, for learning, for learning more. Um, you know, Sienna is probably one of the best documented um, um, applications that I've seen. Um, there's a manual that was just updated a couple of weeks ago that has an incredible amount of 
information. Um, <clears throat> the, let's see, there's the manual. There's a couple of review articles. Um, this one is the method in general. This one is about kind of behavior change. There's links to those as well as a bunch of other kinds of stuff on, on Tom Snyder's um, website. And that's updated regularly. There's a listserv that um, is, is very useful for getting feedback on these, on these methods. Um, and if you really want to know how kind of the algorithms work, there's a hundred something page PDF that goes through all of the statistical kind of machinations behind, behind the scenes. So let's stop there and um, take another little break before we'll, we'll get into the lab. If you haven't downloaded the lab, it's, it's up. And let's see, if you haven't already, download RCNF. We'll get going in a, in a few minutes. <laughs>